Shall we open our Bibles this evening to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 7? Hopefully you all have your notes. If not, they are available at the counter out in the foyer on your way out, or they're all available in the bookstore each week if you missed. You can keep us in prayer. We're working on being able to put all of the studies here from the church online live. So if you're home or you're stuck somewhere, you'll be able to just tune in whatever the time the service is. Um, we'll be broadcasting live over the internet. So that's our next little move. It just requires some bandwidth, and we'll see how the Lord works that out. But we're looking forward to that. In fact, uh, I think it's been very effective from some of the folks we know that are putting their studies out, that just to help folks, especially radio folks too, they, they tend to want to watch. So they'll get to tune in and see this. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> we started the last book of the Bible five or six weeks ago, and mentioned to you at that time that John was caught in the first century, really, persecution of the church. Domitian, the emperor, had a goal of wiping out Christians in the world. He really did want to just completely destroy um, the people of God. And so John, being in his 90s, was exiled to the island of Patmos, where they really hoped he would just die. But God had other plans. God came to visit John, gave to him this final look at really what Jesus will come to do. He in all of his glory, the, the fulfillment of, of everything from Genesis to this book, and really God's promises completely fulfilled. The Lord gave to John a vision of his glory in chapter 1 and then said to John, I want you to write what you've seen, and he did. He wrote down in, in great detail, the, what he saw as he watched and looked at the Lord in glory. Was told to write the things that are. Speaking of the church age, which we are currently in, in chapter 2 and 3, and we'll finish next time. And then to write the things which shall come hereafter. And that's really what most folks think about when they think about the book of Revelation. They think about things to come. And so from chapter 4 through chapter 18, we will look at things to come. And, and when will they come? And in what manner? And how will God accomplish those things? But we first have to see the church age in chapter 4 and 5, and then the church taken up, I should say, in chapter 4 and 5, the Lord catching us up into heaven. And chapter 4 and 5, we'll spend at least three weeks in looking at the church seated in heaven around God's throne. And you should pay particular attention because there's a lot of weird stuff going on. And if you, you, know, if you show up in heaven one day and go, hey, what's this? They'll know you haven't read this book. So... <laughs> We want you to take good notes so you don't embarrass us. You know, you got the Morning Star shirt on. Hey, what's this? No, no. <laughs> Terrible. Terrible. So you got to come for all of those three weeks. So we're currently in the second part of, of chapter 1, verse 19 outline. The things that you've seen, John wrote, chapter 1. The things that are, the church age, chapter 2 and 3. And then the things which will come hereafter. Now the things that are, are really consisting of these two chapters of seven letters that Jesus sent to seven churches in Asia Minor that fully give to us the heart of God for the church. This is God's heart, God's outlook, God's concern, and God's interest in what we as a church should be. And so we've been looking at them systematically. We, we've tried to look at them in, in, in the same manner in each one. We've told you, I think, several weeks now that, that first and foremost, you apply these to yourself personally. You're the church. You're God's people. God has chosen you to be his own. So, you know, you read these letters and you read them to you. The Lord is speaking to you and I as Christians. He then speaks to churches because churches are defined by the things they do and don't do. And these churches were certainly definitive of, of types of churches, congregationally so. And then thirdly or finally, we look at them prophetically because we find that the churches in the order which they are given give to us a, a flow, if you will, of, of the church age from the time of Jesus, from the time of the birth of the church, from, from the book of Ephesus, or the, or the church in Ephesus, if you will, the first one, until the last uh, day's church. And we've come this far so that tonight we begin to look at the last of the two churches, but they both represent last day's churches. They are both outgrowths historically of the Protestant Reformation, one very sweet, the other pretty bitter. Both are clearly seen, and I, I don't doubt that we will see them as well as the others until the day that Jesus returns. But in, in, in so-called Protestant churches today, you find some folks are tremendously faithful to the word of God while others deny its authority, 
seek rather to somehow fit it into the world intellectually. They, they, they find, these final two churches speak of both streams. And, and Philadelphia and Laodicea are, are just that, the, the two arms of the church in the last days, the godly remnant, the shining still, the spiritual arm, Philadelphia, and then the church that has turned away from God who will, will, will be found out by the Lord at his coming. Historically, there was a tremendous evangelism explosion following the Reformation. It, it lasted from 1750 or so through World War I and even beyond. It began in Europe first, eventually filtered its way here to the States, guys like Whitfield and Wesley and Spurgeon and Finney and Edwards and Moody. Um, you really can't find, you know, greater men of God in that generation than those men that were part of that evangelism explosion. Uh, Wearsby years ago wrote a book called Walking with the Giants, and I checked in the bookstore to see if it was still available, and they've put it out under, a, they've actually combined two books and, and put it out under a title that starts with the words, 50 People Every Christian Should Know. But if you ever get a chance to get the Wearsby book, 50 uh, people every Christian should know, and then there's even more to the title, I forget what it is, but that's enough to remember. Great reading, succinct, and the synoptics are really good to see how God and, and what God was doing as a result of the Protestant Reformation, the return of, of people to the scriptures. But tonight we want to look at verse 7 through 13 of chapter 3, the, the church of Philadelphia. In fact, we read in verse 7, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the angelos, the pastor, the messenger, the overseer, <clears throat> the Lord's sixth letter. Philadelphia was <clears throat> located about 25 miles south and east of Sardis. Its name, Brotherly Love, came from the folks who built it in honor of King Attalus Philadelphus of Pergamus. So he was a fellow that was honored with his own city, <clears throat> the, the city was sponsored in the building by his brother, a fellow named King Eumenus. And that really was the, the gestation of the, of the city itself. It was a Greek city. It worshipped lots of pagan gods. The chief god of Philadelphia was a god named Dionysius, who was the god of wine, or revelry, or partying. Maybe some of you worshipped this god before you got saved. <clears throat> I know I may have had a couple of visits to his altar. Uh, the area was known for its abundant vineyards, and that's really why, you know, Dionysius was, was embraced. <clears throat> Along with Sardis, Philadelphia was destroyed in that 17 AD earthquake that just absolutely leveled the area. Tiberius rebuilt the city. It was very resistant early on to Muslim influence. In fact, even through the Middle Ages, the city stayed pretty much a Christian city as far as the message that was taught from it. The city today remains under the name Alashir, the city of God. Um, there are still several churches that are teaching the gospel there. It is a smaller city today, but yet it still exists there in Turkey. <clears throat> in this letter that Jesus writes, there is not the slightest hint of a rebuke. It is a letter that is very refreshing. It is filled with praise and promise and encouragement and blessing. If I was going to get a letter from the Lord, I'd want this one. I looked over all the seven, I picked this one. <clears throat> it is by far the most encouraging. This was a church fellowship that was reaching out in faith, that was alive in Christ, that was extended in their ministry to the full. They were eagerly looking for his return. They were serving him from a heart of love. It is a perfect letter to get if you're waiting upon the Lord. If you want God to look at you and the church and the people of God, that way, for sure. We read in verse 1 there, These things says he <clears throat> who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I'm in the wrong place, aren't I? Verse 7. <laughs> my Bible is not good. Uh, neither are my eyes. These things says he who is holy and he who is true. Am I right now? And, and he who has the keys of David, and he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. <clears throat> Up to now, Jesus has, in every letter, described himself in his introduction by taking one facet of John's vision of him in chapter 1 that related to the part that would relate to the message that he was going to give, and then gave the message of the letter. That isn't the case here. Instead, Jesus takes a title for himself 
from another part of the Old Testament that was a well-known prophecy which spoke of he, the Messiah, being God. But first, before we get to that, we read here in verse 7, these things says he who is holy and he who is true. The word holy, when it applies to God, is both a title and a characteristic. It is a characteristic that can only be applied to God. It means to be set apart, to be indeed holy. When Isaiah wrote of him speaking there in chapter 57, in speaking of his righteousness, he declared, For thus saith the high and the lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. So God took that name holy for himself. We read in Psalm 111 that holy and awesome is his name. Jesus is holy because he's perfect. He is also holy because he is unique. He is separate. He is the only son of God. There's no one like him. It is the holiness of God that demands justice for sin. God can't just sweep your sins under the rug and say, well, I wish you'd have done better, but since you didn't, you know, let's just change the rules. No, he's holy, so he demands righteous judgment against sin. He is also true. Now, in the Greek, the, 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 the word true literally means genuine or the real thing or the genuine article, if you will. In opposition to all of the false gods that men were worshiping, Jesus really is God. He really is true. John would write in his epistle, 1 John chapter 5, We know that the Son of God has come, that he has given to us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and that we might be in him who is true, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. This is eternal life. So Jesus is the real deal. There's a lot of false gods, a lot of people following a lot of weird gods, but Jesus is the true God. In, in John 17, the Lord said to his disciples there in verse 3, This is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. Now, the same word, when it is used, not in the, in the, in the characteristic of definition of, of, of personage, is also used to describe faithfulness. When, when the word true is used in that regard, it speaks of someone who is true in the sense that you can count on their word. In other words, all of God's promises are true. You can rely on them. They're faithful. As he has said, so he will do. He is faithful and true. He is holy, set apart, without sin, perfect, sinless. And he's the real deal. That's God's declaration of himself to the, to the people in Philadelphia, the church that he loved, that were doing so well. This is what the Holy One and the True One says about you. But then he adds an, an extra identification to himself. It's an interesting one there in quotations. He who has the keys of David, who will open and no one will shut, who will shut and no one will open. Of all of the resources that the Lord may have picked of himself, he picks these as a direct quote. And there's only one other place in the Bible that it is used. And I want you to just take you there for a minute. If you can mark your spot there and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 22. Isaiah chapter 22, beginning in verse 15. <clears throat> if you were with us when we've been going through the Bible, you've gone over this passage. Um, if you're reading through the Old Testament, I'm sure you have discovered it as well. But there's a great scripture here that speaks of the work of the Lord. And God takes two men from history and he uses them to speak to us directly. Now, we'll read in verse 15, Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Go, proceed to this steward to Shebna, who is over the house, a fellow named Shebna, and say, What have you here, and whom have you here, that you have hewn a sepulcher here, as he who would hew a, a, himself a sepulcher on high, or carve a tomb for himself in a rock? Indeed, the Lord will throw you away violently, you mighty man, and surely seize you, and he will surely turn violently and toss you like a ball into a large country. And there you shall die, and your glorious chariot shall be the shame of your master's house. I'll drive you out of your position. From your position, he will pull you down. Then it shall be in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. 
I will clothe him with your robe, strengthen him with your belt, commit your responsibility into his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, and the key to the house of David I will lay on his shoulder. So he shall open and no one shall shut. And he shall shut and no one shall open. And I will fasten him as a peg in a secure place, and he will become a glorious throne to his father's house. Now, God takes these two men from history and shows us how one, very self-serving, pushing himself forward, making great plans for himself, this fellow Shebna, was received by the nation of Israel, but God didn't receive him. In fact, his future judgment was, was certain. The Lord talks about his destruction. The other was God's choice and would much later be recognized as the hope for the people who had initially refused him. It is a prophecy in the Old Testament of the Antichrist coming to fool the nation. And yet God rejecting and dealing with him and then the coming of his son who would open doors that no man could shut and bring life to all who would trust in him. Both of these men used in the scripture through Isaiah, lived in the days of Hezekiah. You can read about them in 2 Kings 18. But God uses them here symbolically to speak of the future. The future that God knew. Remember, he's writing to Philadelphia, and he's speaking to them as the Lord, the Holy One, the True One, the one that can open doors that no man could shut. But it is a direct link to this verse here. Now, in verse 15 down through verse 19 here, Shebna the scribe, had great ideas of his own fame. He had begun to build a sepulcher or a tombstone, which he thought to cut out in Jerusalem for himself. He wanted to leave a legacy. In fact, if you go to Israel on the east side of Jerusalem, but on the western slopes of the Mount of Olives, you will still see many very large and elaborate tombs built by very wealthy men who wanted to be seen as folks would come and go into Jerusalem itself. God says to Shebna, you'll not be dying here. You're not going to die here. Judah would escape from Assyria and hope to stay put, but due to their pride, they would eventually, a century later, be carried to Babylon. Now, that's the short term. The, the long term is, you know, the Antichrist is not going to meet his goal of being Lord of the earth. Down in verse 20, <clears throat> the Lord then begins to compare his servant in that day. Very important language. In that day is a usual uh, Hebrew and both Greek terminology to speak of the last days. In that day, Eliakim, who happened in, in a short term to be a, a Hezekiah's cabinet minister, he exemplified God's choice and God's plans for the future. Eliakim, who was the prime minister for Hezekiah, was the only one who could decide who could see Hezekiah and who could not. His decisions could not be overthrown by anyone but the king himself. Now, Israel will be courted by Shebna and deceived for a time, but then the true Messiah will come. He'll be unveiled. Jesus will be this one that is a type of Eliakim, or in the picture, if you will, a typology of Eliakim, as these verses in verse 22 clearly show. Jesus quotes them for himself to literally say, I've got the authority to open and shut, and I am the Messiah that has the keys of David. I have the authority of David. I've come in the lineage of David. You've recognized who I am. And, and just like that Isaiah 9 passage where it talks about his name will be wonderful counselor and mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, of his increase, of his government, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order and establish it, that'll be Jesus. So he ties himself into a very well-known Jewish proverb, a, a type and a picture of really a a representative that would come to Israel and they would say, we want you, and, and you're the one, and, and, but he's not. But in that day, the Lord will come, who will be the one to open the doors for those who, who need to enter in as they come by faith. No man can shut the doors. No man can open the doors. He gives life. And in fact, at the end here in verse 24 and verse 25, he ends the prophecy by speaking of a peg, Jesus, if you will, upon which man can hang his hopes. Eliakim physically was their hope, but he was still a man. He couldn't deliver what Jesus could, eternal life. But the key in verse 22, given to Eliakim as a steward over the house of the king, meant he could have access to the treasury of the king. Now Jesus comes and says, I'm the one who can open and no man can shut. And in Christ, we are enabled to get to the resources of the king. Beautiful introduction. 
In the same manner, the keys of heaven belong to the church, those who preach in Jesus' name. And the Lord used that same analogy, you might remember, when he was talking with Peter there in Matthew 16. And he, and he, he talked about Peter's declaration, building the house upon really, and the church upon the declaration of Peter. And then the Lord said to him, I will give to you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on the earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on the earth will be loosed in heaven. You have the authority to preach in, in the earth how man can be free to go to heaven. We have the gospel. In, in Luke 24, John chapter 20, on Easter evening, it is the Lord who breathes on his disciples, the risen Lord. It says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he gives them the same authority, uses the same wording. Whosoever sends you loose, they're loose. Whoever sends you bind, they're bound. But it is the same Lord. And so, if you compare, for example, Matthew 23, where the Lord says to the scribes and the Pharisees, you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, you don't go in yourself, and, and yet you also don't allow those who are entering to go in. You're, you're in the way. You're not, you're not opening the doors. You're, you're blocking the doors, if you will. So, um, we have the key, and the key is Jesus, and he's the, the one that is the fulfillment of Isaiah 22, um, verse 22 here. Now, let's go back, if you will, to Revelation. So Jesus' introduction of himself is, I am holy, set apart, alone, God, sinless. I'm the real deal, and I have authority to send you forth in my name to find strength with me. And that's the Lord's will for the church that he might empower you and I, you know, to go forward in his name. When the Lord met with Moses and he saw the sufferings of his people, he said to Moses, I have come and I have heard the affliction of my people and I have seen their suffering. Come, I will send you now, therefore. And God enabled them. You go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But yet God will be with us even to the end of the age. So, in his introduction, Jesus says something very important to the, to the Philadelphian church. He, he literally says to them, I'm going to enable you and empower you. I'm the one who you can depend upon. And they've been looking to him. And they hadn't had much strength. But the Lord was going to give them more strength now. He says in verse 8 to them, I know your work. See, I have set before you an open door. And no one can shut it. There's the application. For you have a little strength. You have kept my word. You have not denied my name. So the application to this church, Jesus says what he says to each church. I know your works. I'm aware of what you're doing. But he adds to them, I'm aware of where you're at in your spiritual life. And I am here to set before you an open door. And the key of David in the hand of Jesus, who will rule and reign forever, is to allow his servants to go forward and to do and to accomplish great things in this life. That's the will of God for the church. That we might carry his name you know, we use the term open door a lot. You know, it's used a lot in the New Testament. It, it, by definition, an open door is a God-given opportunity in outreach or in service. Um, Paul, when he was there in Acts chapter 14, uh, when they had come together and gathered the church together, he gave them a report of everything that God had been doing with them. And he said to them, God has really given us an open door of faith to the Gentiles. The Lord has given us great opportunity. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and he had been in Troas, he, he wrote and said to the Corinthians, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened to me by the Lord. When Paul wrote from prison to the Colossians, he said to them, could you pray for us that God would open up a door for us to speak his word? For which reason I'm also in chains. So we understand that this open door issue is really one of God beginning to go before us to give us opportunities to serve him. Now here's the last day's church, the Philadelphian church, walking with God. And the Lord literally says to the church, you will find no shortage of opportunities to serve the Lord. I'll set before you an open door. In other words, there is great opportunity for the church in the last days. God gives us more opportunities than we have laborers. The, the laborers are few, but the work is great. The, the, the fields are white. We have plenty of opportunities to step forward and to step out. When, when Jesus was telling Peter about getting the keys of, 
of the kingdom and, and telling the disciples. He, he then said to them, I will build my house upon, uh, you are Peter on this rock, I'll build my church. And then he says, the gates of hell, they won't prevail against you. Great opportunities the Lord gives to the church. And the promises of fruitfulness where, where God goes before us and opens doors, where there's no need to strive and there's no need to struggle. And you don't have to give artificial respiration to ministry. You know, you don't have to say, oh, hundreds came when there were only three. Or we're touching the world when you haven't even gotten outside of town yet. You know, the Lord sets before you an open door. No man can shut it. God goes before you. And in these last days, as the Lord, Lord pours his spirit out upon his people, Jesus, coming to the church, hands the open doors to faithful churches so that he might use you and bless you and go before you. You know, you, it's always a good question to say to yourself, how is my ministry doing? Is it going smoothly or am I always struggling? Is there an open door or do I find myself constantly banging my head against a closed one? You know, one of the ways you can discover what God wants for you is, is how the doors are standing. You know, there's so many things we could do. What does God want us to do and you to do? If we are faithful to do as God directs, I believe we should also find open doors to do what he wants. Ones no man can shut. It may look like you'll never get away with it. Oh, well, watch what God will do. You know, as, as the churches are planted and lives are changed and elders are raised up and fruit comes, God has a way of building the church in the last days. But as the Lord introduces himself to this church as the one who has the power and has the authority and is the chosen one that the Old Testament spoke of, the one that God would honor and God would set upon the throne, he said to the church, I got the keys and I'll set before you an open door. The faithful church in the last days has lots to do, has lots to accomplish, has lots by which they can go and serve the Lord. And notice that Jesus articulates three reasons for blessing them or the blessings of God being poured out upon them. He says, first of all, you have a little strength. They had remained faithful and diligent with what little power they had. This was not a large church. They didn't have great numbers. They weren't in a huge building. They didn't have so many outreaches, but they did faithfully carry forth what, what, with what God had entrusted them to do so far. He, he saw the church and he said, I'm going to give you an open door. You have been faithful, though you've had little strength. I, I think this is, by the way, always the way that you find God's uh, method of growing. He looks for those who are faithful in the little things, when few are watching, when the only motive is just to love his people and to love the Lord. And then if he finds that faithfulness when you have a little strength, then God can entrust to you greater things. There, there's a parable at the end of Matthew 25 where the Lord, in speaking about the talents, said, so you've received five talents and you've brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered me to five, I've gained five more. And the Lord will say, well done, you good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. Now I will make you faithful over, or I make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Faithful in the little brings greater opportunity. Unfaithful in the little pretty much shuts the door. But what does he say of this church? This church had, had, had stayed walking with God. He knew their works. He knew that they only had a little strength. I think if you apply your feeble, feebleness faithfully to his work, you'll find his blessing. Does that make sense? You just give it your best to the work of God, regardless of how little or how much you think you can really contribute, and God will turn around and bless it. I got saved in a home Bible study in the 70s over in Bellflower. My first ministry was to teach a home Bible study and to, to oversee it. And I had to learn very quickly that God was interested in those people who came. He wasn't so interested in me or in how I felt about things. He was interested in the folks that he brought every week. And, and I've, I've told you before, embarrassingly so, that the, the study had 105 people coming or so until I took over. And then we were down to three in six weeks. <laughs> Don't laugh. That was horrible. And I was so discouraged. I really thought, man, I, I know God's called me to teach. You did laugh at me. And it's all right, I'm over it now. And I don't know what to do. 
And, and I had a brother and a friend in ministry, and I went and asked him about it, and he said, how many people come? I said, three, unless somebody's six. Then we got two, we lose like 35% right away. And, and he said, do you love those three people? I said, sure. And he said, will you pray for them every day? I said, absolutely. He said, would you study all week to teach them? I said, of course I would. He said, then God will give you 100. You just be faithful to the three. And for six months, we taught three people. And then the seventh month, another couple came. And by the end of the year, we had 150 people. Nothing to do. We weren't raffling stuff off. We weren't giving stuff away. We didn't get a new worship leader. We just, I needed to learn that God cares about his people. That's what we need to learn. You know, it isn't about success. It's about the lives of the individual. That's where the success lies. You have little strength. But the little strength that this church have, they were willing to commit themselves to the things of God. I, I think from a prophetic standpoint, I think we can learn that Jesus says that the last day's church will have little strength. I don't think the church is going to go out in a blaze of glory on the top of the world as those kingdom theology people would have you believe. I think rather the world is getting worse around us. And yet we're to be faithful, aren't we? We're to reach out with the love of God. We read in Matthew 24 about the last days, and, and because lawlessness abounds, the love of many will grow cold. Or, or in Luke chapter 18, where the Lord says, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? I don't think the church is going out, you know, running the show. I think the church is going to go out humbly and quietly and, and be gathered together to the Lord. But yet, in that little strength, it's enough to do great things for the Lord. In fact, a little strength in God's hands is all that you'll ever need, right? When I am weak, then I am strong. So the saints in Philadelphia had learned that. I had to learn it at a home Bible study level, that, that Jesus was interested in faithfulness. God can make a lot out of nothing. Just look at us. Doesn't he get the glory for us? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. The power of Christ rests upon me when I glory and boast in my infirmities. If I'm going to brag, brag in the things you can't do. You any good at singing? No. Can you teach? Not very well. I don't read good. I don't put sentences together well. I'm not a people person. <laughs> what are you doing in the ministry? I don't know. <laughs> but I do know this. God loves his people. And they were outnumbered in this city with a few saints mature, no outstanding leaders to mention. This body was moving forward to the glory of God, and God saw it, and he promised them more open doors. I'm going to use your little strength. You know, Paul said to the Corinthians, a great and effective door has been opened for me here in Ephesus, and there are many adversaries. He was thrilled. You know, he was just getting started, even in the midst of difficult. So you have little strength. I know your works. I'm going to give you an open door, because I see that you have little strength, and yet you've been faithful. Secondly, he said, you have kept my word. I'll tell you what, obedience is the definitive proof of your love for the Lord. Obedience is the definitive proof of your love for the Lord. Jesus said, if you have my commandments and keep them, you it is who loves me. There's no way around that. How do I love the Lord? I obey the Lord. I believe he is the Lord. I, I check in, Lord, what would you have me to do? Well, do this. All right, I love you. Then do it. Got it. And the church here was doing it. They had faithfully walked in the word of God. There are unfortunately many churches today who have altogether forsaken the regular teaching of the Bible. They have emotional appeals. They have social commentaries. They drive to be relevant and up to date. But they have lost the, the, the sight of and the view of that God's word is what gives us life. And it is there where we meet the love of God. And it is there where we love God back. God's word. If you call churches, look them up on the internet and say to them, look, I'd like a verse by verse, verse study through the minor prophets. You will, out of 100 churches, find 95% of them that say, yeah, we don't do those. We don't teach those. And you wonder, why, well, why did the Lord put them all in there? So we could just set them aside? Absolutely not. It is far more rare today to find churches that are teaching the Bible than you might have thought. We can buy Sunday school curriculum today that teaches evolution as a possibility, that has homosexual pastors claiming acceptability with God, 
that turned the word of God into a secular psychology place to find a peace that passes all understanding. Not this church, not Philadelphia. They hung on to and they kept hold of the word of God. There is tremendous pressure on the church today to abandon Genesis for science and salvation by redemption to anthropology and life in the spirit to psychology and the very word itself to higher criticism. Not so in Philadelphia. You've had a little strength. You've kept my word. Oh, what a, that's what I want the Lord to say to us. You've kept my word. The Bible is the most scrutinized book in history, and it still stands. And I have no difficulty believing it in its entirety. I've never heard an argument, as long as I've been a Christian, or a reason that caused me to challenge that trust that I have in God's word. I've seen God fulfill his promises. I'm going to keep his word. That's what we should do. Little strength, keep his word. Thirdly, you've not denied my name. Now, there were some, you remember back in the Pergamos church, back in chapter 2, verse 13, where the Lord says, you have some that have been faithful, haven't denied my name, that have stuck with the Lord. And by the way, the name is that which, you know, is implied in the name of Christ. Savior, Messiah, Lord, came in the flesh, died, ascended, or died, rose, ascended. They were committed to Jesus in word and in action. And imagine being in this church in a society that was just locked into you know, the God of wine. And Paul had approached them carefully there in Acts 17, talked to them about the unknown God. But here Jesus gives an open door to a, to a small church who had been faithful with their little bit of strength, who had been keeping God's word, had not been unfaithful to his name, and because of that, God was giving them an open door to serve and to reach out. That's what you want from the Lord. I can trust you to do more. Here, let me open the door. Great letter. Verse 9, no rebuke. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie. Indeed, I'll make them come, worship before your feet, and know that I have and, and to know that I've loved you. And because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell upon the earth. No rebuke. This is usually the rebuke section right after the commendation, but there isn't any. What you find instead are true, awesome promises from Jesus to his own. In verse 9, a protection from the hostility of unbelievers and a justification or an exoneration of their faith in the future. And in verse 10, a deliverance from the wrath of God's judgment, which is coming to try upon the whole earth those who don't believe in him. Deliverance from God's judgment an exoneration before the eyes of the world that their faith will be such that we will find men bowing down before God along with us. They won't choose to do so. We will. In Philippians chapter 2, we read about the Lord having a mind, or it says, let this mind be in you that's also in Christ, who being in the form of God didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. He took the form of a bondservant. He came in the likeness of men. Found as an appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and gave him a name, which is above every name. Jesus humbly came, came as a servant, obedient to death, death on the cross. And during the process, he endures all the false accusations, the mockery, the blaspheming, the persecution. He was a somebody who became a nobody to make us nobody somebodies with God. And now we're called to follow his example and submit ourselves to the care of the Father. And one day, in the eyes of the critics, you're going to be made just. They're going to see that, that your God was right. And as Jesus was honored and given a name above every name, so you will be raised up by the Lord in due time. In fact, I think the psalmist wrote in Psalm 23 that the Lord would set a table before him in the presence of your enemies. In other words, you're going to be seen to be God's people in the eyes of those who today would criticize your faith in him. The religious community that was persecuting the Philadelphia saints, Jesus calls of the synagogue of Satan. Those are pretty harsh words. Uh, but, it, you know, Paul said to the Ephesians, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual uh, hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. This was a spiritual battle, and, and religious disguises are often a tool of the enemy, you know. 
Jesus talked to a bunch of guys there in John 8, and they, they had just day, you know, half an hour earlier claimed that they believed in him, trusted in him. And then they began to question him and to challenge him. And Jesus finally said, you are of your father, the devil. When he lies, he speaks of his own resources. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. And he, he said, you're just like your father. Now, Jesus says here to them, continue in faithfulness for one day you will see, or, or they will see that you are right and that they are of the wicked one. They must then bow their knee to me and know my love for you. Great promise. You're going to be vindicated as, when all is said and done. That's going to be a good day, don't you think? When the Lord is honored. Secondly, in verse 10, the Lord will keep you from the hour of trial. The word keep literally means to be kept out of. The word is ek, but it means kept out of. The great tribulation, the hour of trial that will come upon the whole world. Why? Because they had kept his commandment to persevere. Literally, they hung in there because they believed in him to the end. They kept his word. He would keep them from the judgment of the great tribulation when the wrath of God is poured out. You will read in Revelation, I think, 6.16 as we begin that portion of the things to come. And you will read that it says, And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us. And hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the, of, of the Lamb, for the, for the day of his great wrath is come. Who is able to stand? The, the one distinction of the great tribulation is that the wrath that men face will come from God. It, it is the judgment of God to unbelieving man. You have been delivered in Christ from the wrath of God, which is why you will no longer be here when these things take place. So, we walk with God. We look forward to the rapture of the church. We look forward to the Lord calling us. Jesus said there in Luke 21, Watch therefore, pray always, you might be counted worthy to escape these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. We've got to keep our eyes upon him who makes us worthy. And notice that the Lord says the tribulation would be to test those who dwell upon the earth, those that are left behind, those that are lost. Jesus said to, to, the, to the saints in John 15, if you were of the world, the world would love you. But you're not of the world. I've chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. You're not of the world. You, you aren't a part of this any longer. So God will deliver you, which, which from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth, to those who are left behind. It'll come without warning. It'll come unannounced. Heaven and earth will pass away, the Lord said there in Luke 21, but my word will by no means pass away. But you take heed to yourself, lest your heart becomes weighed down with carousing or drinking or cares of this life. And that day come upon you unexpectedly, it can come as a snare upon all those who dwell upon the face of the whole earth. To the church in Philadelphia, God made great promises. I'm going to take you out before the judgment comes. And we're told in, I think it's 2 Thessalonians 2.11, that those who are left will be subjected to a severe deception by the enemy. They'll actually believe there's some plausible explanation for the saints no longer being around. So God's promise, two promises, vindication and deliverance. Verse 11, behold, I am coming quickly. Now you might read that and say, well, Lord, it's been 2,000 years. Compared to eternity, a thousand years like a day, it's been a couple of days. Hold fast what you have that no man may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Now behold, I come quickly. And, and the word quickly there is not the word for fast or imminent, but the word for suddenly. It is the Greek word for unexpectedly. Behold, I'm coming in an instant that you're not necessarily welcome or waiting for. And by the way, before we get on with, you know, getting the, to the prophecy of the things that are coming, the rapture of the church eschatological-wise or, or end times-wise is really the only event that will come unannounced, that, that no man knows the day or 
knows the hour. Concerning the times and the seasons, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, I, I don't need to write to you, you yourself perfectly, know perfectly well. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So it's going to come without warning. But everything else in the, in the Great Tribulation, at least the, the markers, the, the Antichrist coming to the temple, the, the second coming of the Lord, are, are marked by dates and times and, and formulas where you'll know to the exact day, the, the day that the Lord will return, or, or from the rapture of the church, the day that the Antichrist will come and declare himself to be God at a finished temple. But notice when it comes to the, the gathering together of the saints, there is this... There is this unexpectedness and this suddenness that, that demands of us that we wait each day looking up. You never know when the big one will hit, meaning the Lord will come and you'll be gone. The second coming, you can know to the very day, it'll be exactly 1260 days from the day the Antichrist comes to the rebuilt temple, defiles it, proclaims himself to be God, demands worship as such. Uh, you can read about that in Daniel 7. You can read about it in Daniel 12. Uh, Revelation chapter 11 talks about the outer court of the temple being given to the Gentiles. And we took our, our last group to Israel this year and we went up onto the Temple Mount and, and there the Dome of the Rock stands, the third holiest place for the, for the Muslim faith. And, and to think that you could tear that down without some trouble, you're, you're crazy. You have lots of trouble. But according to the, where the East Gate lines up with the Temple Mount, there is a little dome that sits in direct parallel with the East Gate. It's called the Dome of the Spirits. And if you measure out the temple without the outer court for the Gentiles, you can actually build the new temple on the Temple Mount, never disturb that place. You can just give it to the Gentiles, just like Revelation chapter 11, verse 2 and 3 says. But then you will read that they will tread that holy city underfoot for 42 months. 42 months, three and a half years. Uh, 1,260 days, it tells you, in case you can't figure out 42 months. So we have exact dates for just about all of those major events, except... What gets the ball rolling? The rapture of the church, the end of the church age. So what do we do in the meantime? Hold fast what you have. It's a present imperative in Greek. It means hang in there and keep on doing what you're doing. Don't cave in. Don't quit. Let your dedication and loyalty and commitment to Christ sustain you. Or you know, might ask yourself, as the church of Jesus Christ, how are you waiting? Are you holding fast or barely holding on? Are you ready if he comes tonight? Would you look forward to him coming? So how are you waiting? Hold fast what you have. Don't let any man take your crown. And the word crown there is singular and no doubt refers to the crown of life that is symbolic of the final victory that Jesus will give you at the finish line. So don't walk away from the Lord. Don't, don't turn away. Don't, don't follow another way. Because if you do, no one has any assurance of where you are with your eternal destiny. We know that that, that if you're walking with God and you're seeking the Lord, then we have great assurance. You know, Paul ended his race by saying, you know, I've run the race. I've kept the faith from now on or from here on out. Or I think finally, he might use the word finally, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give me on that day. And not me only, but everyone who loves his appearing. You know, the reward of a life dedicated and lived by faith. And then in verse 12, you get great more promises to the overcomer. You get a permanence promise. You get a security promise. You get an identity promise. As far as permanence, notice, I will make him a pillar in the temple. Now, to be a pillar in the temple is no doubt a figurative statement, yet how neat to see that those with a little strength now will find to be pillars of strength in God's house then. That's pretty cool. Um, Paul, when he wrote to the Galatians in chapter 2, spoke about John and Peter and James, and he said, they seem to me to be pillars. You can find um, that issue later on in the book of Revelation as well, but, but the idea of pillars means that you have a permanent place in the dwelling of God. You're established in him. There's tremendous permanence. You read here in verse um, 12, uh, that, that he shall go out no more. How glorious is that? You know, that's really what Genesis 1 through Revelation 22 is all about. You get to go home at last. Free at last. Second of all, or, or permanent, so there's security. You don't have to go in and out. And then look at your identity here. And the Lord promises them three names. The name of the Father, the name of the 
new city, not Philadelphia, maybe they'll be called the new Jerusalemites, I don't know, and the new name of the Son. And then back in chapter 2, verse 17, you have a nickname that only God knows. So you've got a lot of new names. Uh, I think it's in Revelation 22, 4 that, that talks about the, you know, the, almost the end of things. And, and, and when Jesus appears, they, there's a verse that says, They shall see his face, and his name shall be upon their foreheads. In other words, um, I think the point is that we'll be clearly marked as belonging to God. You'll be more clearly labeled than a sales item on a sales rack. He owns you. You belong to him. There will be no doubt. You're going to be a pillar. You're not going to go out anymore. And you're going to be clearly marked as belonging to him. That's a pretty good bunch of promises, isn't it, to the church of the last days. So you have a little strength. You've kept my word because you love the Lord. You haven't denied his name. And because of that, God will set before you an open door. And only the Lord can do that. Because the church cannot go forward on business sense or connections, or money, or influence. The church can only succeed if the Lord sets before us an open door. The church is his work, not ours, right? It's his power. It's his blessing. It's his anointing. It's his spirit. It's his work. And to the last day's church that will be faithful, he gives them these wonderful promises of, of effective living, great fruitfulness, and glorious future. Next week... We'll look at the other side of the coin, the Laodiceans. It is, the, it is the, the church that brings the Lord to tears. So read ahead. We'll finish that, and then we will begin the third part of the book, what happens after the church is taken out, after these things. Shall we pray? Father, it is our great desire to be this church in your eyes, to be those who have been faithful in all that you have given to them, to be willing to stand up for your name, to honor you with all that we have, to use what little strength you've given us to serve our God, that we would be keepers of your word, that we would love you, Lord, with all of our lives. That we would, even as we read here, Lord, not deny your name. That you would vindicate us in the eyes of the world, especially those religious opposers. That you would keep us from that day of tribulation that is coming. That we would hold fast. That we wouldn't lose our crown. That we would overcome. Be pillars. Not go out anymore and be identified with your name upon our life. Church, that is what God would want us to be. This is the letter that I'm sure he would desire to send to everybody. But that's not the way it is. There are those who fall under all of those other categories. But here's the church that can be, that, that could be. This is, this is certainly what we want to be in his eyes. Faithful with the little we have. Just dedicated to him no matter what and obeying his word, and not denying his name. Father, that that might be our testimony. And Tonight, if you need prayer, the, the pastors will be up front. If you, if you need to know that you know, that you know, that you have a relationship with Jesus, that if you were to die tonight, or if the Lord would come tonight, that you would for sure go to be with him. If you're not certain, then you come and speak to one of the, the men here, and they will not only pray with you, but they will be happy to guide you through the scriptures and show you and, and, and direct you so that you might know the heart and the will of God. So you might be saved. You know, the Bible says that, that the Lord doesn't rejoice in the death of the wicked. He does in the death of the saints because absent from the body, then present with the Lord. But his desire is that all men would be saved, that all would come to the knowledge of him. That he doesn't want to lose any. In fact, Peter says the Lord tarries in his coming because he wants all to be saved. God is just waiting. Maybe he's waiting tonight for you. The Lord will give you life tonight if you'll call upon his name. He'll save you from your sin. He'll wash you because his son died for you. 
He's, he's God, Kuska. He has the keys. He'll give you an open door. He'll give you eternal life. So you come. Do it tonight. Before you walk out the door, let the Lord have your life.